so my name is Mike Mulligan. I'm Associate Dean for Graduate Studies. Uh, I usually have this workshop every summer and every fall during the first uh, week of the quarter. Um, it's really uh, primarily directed at people that want to apply for this year for the NSF GR GFRP and as well, I try to cover you know, some of the other things that are available from within the school to give you a sort of a vision of what are the possibilities. I'm going to start by letting Harinder Singh, Dr. Harinder Singh is the director of GPS STEM uh, and he runs great programs and many of them, I depend on him for running many of these. And so Harinder, I'm going to give you the microphone and then why don't you start just by giving yourself a very brief sort of introduction of, um, you know, who, a bio sketch on who you are academically and that sort of stuff and what your role in GPS STEM is. Go ahead, Harinder. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. Um, so my name is Harinder Singh. I'm the program director of GPS STEM Graduate Professional Success and STEM program here. My background is I got my PhD in cardiovascular biology from Temple School, Temple University School of Medicine. And um, I had no idea what I wanted to do after PhD. So I defaulted into postdoc. And, but then when I started my postdoc, I had, I developed like really good idea and I got very productive in my postdoc. I published really high impact papers and I got funded also, but then I got so much of other training that I, it, it was hard to leave academia. So therefore I wanted to stay within academia, but do something more related to professional development. So that's how I got into this role. And I've been running this program for a little more than a year now which was earlier funded by NIH BEST, BEST, Broadening Experiences in Scientific Training. And now we transition into institutional funding. So we call it GPS-10. So we also serve and cater to other uh, non-biomedical schools also GPS-10. Um, is that enough, Mike? That's great, terrific. I'm responding to a chat, so go right ahead. Next slide. Yes, please, okay. thank you. Uh, so the mission of our GPS STEM program is we are not going to help you to become great scientists and researchers, but we are also going to, we also expose you to a variety of different careers which come out of PhD and postdoctoral training. There are a lot of transferable skills you learn during this process, which can easily be applied to transition into any career. So therefore, but you need to have that knowledge and, and career exploration and training to be able to get into that. Um, so we prepare you for both academic and professional non-academic careers to ensure graduate success because we want all of you to have a job and all of you to be successful after you get out of UCI. We do not want you to be waiting to get a job or be not be successful in whatever you end up doing after that. Next slide, please, Mike. Sorry. Oh, it was oh, in the chat. There we go. It, yeah. Uh, this um, yes. Sorry. Yeah. So we have a four part, four pillar model to career, explore, career um, and professional development. So first of all, uh, it all program depends on my IDP. Uh, some of you may know about my IDP, some, you know, some of you are just starting, so don't know, but then IDP is something, individual development plan, which Mike and I have been trying to really push and make it some sort of like a uh, foundation for your academic, non-academic training. The different kind of IDP formats, you know, we have a curated format at UCI, which is IDP, in which you work with your PI, and chemistry department has a chem IDP, which American Chemical Society started. But my IDP is an online platform, which I highly, highly recommend all of you to take it, because what this is gonna help you is, is gonna help you identify your skills, interests, values, I know that a lot of people go and do the skills assessment and there are tons of like these uh, psychology sort of programs to see where you fit in, you know, what's your best interest and where you'll be successful. But this uh, platform sort of uses the same thing and will actually, based on 9,000, 10,000 uh, postdoc and grad student data that is collected based on that algorithm, it will actually give you as to what career you might fit in. And a majority of people who are starting, they are great in academic careers. And you have, it, then it's going to give you a stepwise approach how you can prepare for that career. If you want to be in research and research faculty, then it'll give you all those things. You know, you should attend these conferences, you know, write a paper, submit this grant. So that's, I highly recommend this. And also every six months, this will give you a ping that, okay, you have not done IDP and do it again. So you can update that because you'll see as you go along, your interests are going to change. And, you know, if they are changing, that's fine. That's a good news. Um, in our program, you have to do this IDP and submit the certificate and every year to we ask you to submit that. So this helps us to keep track of what you're interested in, how, you know, interests are taking shape. 
Another important feature of my IDP or IDP is that when you're writing grants, a lot of grants will ask you for IDP. So when I wrote my American Heart Association Foundation grant, they asked me for a whole my IDP certificate. And what the certificate it, it generates in the end, people, my grant reviewers are able to see what my skills, interests, values are. And if I am picking a career based on that and how much preparation and planning I've done to get into that. So this is a basic for our program. And based on that, we you learn about you know, career exploration. The next step is whatever you decide um, you are gonna be good at, you know, this is your career. You're gonna, uh, Mike, one slide back again. Sure. Please. So the next part is the train. We'll give you training on that. And this is the part I'm gonna talk about today. And once you get the training, we'll give you that experience to get into any kind of career you wanna get into. And then the last part is transition. We'll help you to transition to whether it's postdoc faculty position because this program is for postdocs also, and then you know other industry careers. So today I'm gonna to talk about the training part. Next slide, please, Mike. So the training part, we have the graduate profession success team academic advancement activities out of the many other different activities too. So one of the main uh, part of this academic advancement activities, fellowship success for graduate students and postdocs. It's a 10 week uh, fellowship writing course, which David Fruman, who was the previous director of the program, um, Professor Mike Mulligan, we all sat together and designed this thing. We read a lot of paper, came up with like the best practices in grant and fellowship courses. And that's what I'll talk about briefly. The second part, again, you know, other than writing grants, it's almost like a catch-22 situation. You have to publish really well to be able to get a grant, but then you, you are able to publish really well once you have refined ideas and you're, you have a grant in place. So both these aspects sort of like feed and tie into each other. So we have free subscription. We paid uh, for Nature Masterclasses. It's a great platform to learn about manuscript writing, Peer review, peer review process and how to sort of like, you know, hone and polish your manuscript before it goes out. So this doesn't really help you to publish into nature, but then, you know, it helps you to, uh, you know, be able to learn how to um, uh, communicate your research in an effective way. You will be doing a lot of research that will be primary component, but you'll see that as you go along that the writing is becomes a major, major component of your academic training, not only writing grants, but also writing manuscripts. So this is gonna be really, um, you know, the important element of the academic advancement activity. Um, next slide, please, Mike. I'll talk a little bit about the academic, the fellowship writing course. So how is the, I said that this is, you know, we learned from many different, you know, platforms, a lot of papers are being published about what's the best grant writing course. Many different kinds of grant writing courses are offered out there, but then sometimes they're very traditional methods. So Mike and David, we took a very innovative approach and we said, okay, this not only has to be a didactic form of lecture uh, series, which is, you know, this is based on F series, F31 pre-doc, F32 postdoc, but the same element, same model can be applied to NSF grants also. So pretty much the foundation remains the same. And there are a lot of elements which you can learn from. When we offered this course a couple of months ago, we had a lot of people who were writing NSF grant. And you know, when, I, when we did the evaluation, people loved it. The, another element, great element of this uh, found, uh, fellowship writing course is peer-to-peer -peer working groups. I mean, it, you always work with your PIs, but then I think, you know, before you go to PI to make their job easier, also you want to have a polished content. And, you know, it's easier to work between your peers with the other fellow grad students and postdocs, because then you don't have that, you know, nobody's judging you for, you know, how you're writing, you know, how your grant is coming along. So peer-to-peer -peer working groups, since it was all online, we did it in breakout rooms and that worked really great. We also facilitate um, the sessions by bringing in people who, um, have received the grants or have written the grants. Sometimes it's your peers or faculties who come and once you submit the draft of your grant, they will help you to uh, give you a feedback on that. So it goes step by step. First, it'll be research plan, you know, specific aims before that introduction and background aspect. So this really all throughout the process you're engaged and then people who've gotten grants or who's written grants, they'll give you feedback on that. We have a panel on lessons learned. So these, again, something which is gonna to happen today, people who got NSF grant, they're gonna come and talk about the experience. It's always great to hear from your peers, you know, how they went through that journey, journey of like getting the grant or even writing it. It's a very intimidating process when you're thinking about writing a grant and we wanna sort of like really break that, you know, fear around it and, you know, offer you advice coming from your peer. The last, well, during this process, NIH has a lot of resources, uh, writing resources on how to write a grant. 
they also run a podcast on working scientists. I highly recommend that, you know, listen to podcast series. And also they have videos on, you know, different elements, different parts of the grant, which you should all like listen to and watch it. And they are very, very helpful. Sometimes, you know, we're trying to do our best, but then still we miss out on certain elements. And then learning from NIH and these folks who do this thing every day in and day out, and they're looking for something specific in your grants, that's what you'll get to hear from them. Mike, last, next slide, please. So, so the course, again, we will be offering, uh, Mike and David, we are working to maybe make it a credit course and you know, we'll even expand it, make it even bigger. So stay tuned for that part. But then this is the nature masterclasses I was talking about. This platform offers you great knowledge. You need to have great ideas. You need to have a great experimental design, be able to effectively communicate your ideas. And that this nature masterclasses will help you in that. It's an online learning platform. You can self pace it, do, you know, watch a video, go work on your manuscript, come back, watch another video, you know, and then go back and, you know, work on your uh, uh, manuscript. And, and this is really, you know, in the end, you are also awarded a certificate so that you, this is something you can add in your grant when you're submitting. This can also be your, my IDP proposal that you will take nature master classes training, or if you have taken nature master classes training for manuscript or science writing, your grants are reviewed very favorably. So I highly recommend because it is free. And, and I mean, this is not all the institutes have this privilege of having it for free. So use it while you're sitting at home. Um, this is something which can be done online or even when you're working in the lab, you have some downtime, you can watch these videos and prepare yourself for that. Um, that's about it, what I have. Please feel free to ask me questions in chat or write me an email. I'm happy to answer you, help you with uh, any, any questions you might have. That's great, thank you, Harinder. If people have questions, load them into group chat. And then for economy of time, I'm gonna go ahead and forge forward rather than breaking for you know uh, questions with the group. So. Um, Oh, here. Uh, okay, so I'm going to do two things in my part of the talk. The first is I just want to sort of uh, segue off of what Harinder just talked about and talk about sort of the opportunities that are available in fellowships uh, and, and supported by UCI, GPS STEM, U, uh, UCI Graduate Division, etc. Um, so GPS STEM is a fantastic program. Uh, Harinder is terrific. Um, it really works nicely for for me because I can hand him stuff and he does it all really nicely. Um, and Dr. Fruman uh, is also the academic director for, for that program. And he's a professor in immunology and microbiology and biochemistry. And he's just a fantastic faculty member. And so what Herder talked about Professor Fruman's uh, grant writing uh, course, which is a 10 week course that he, he described. It's got a number of different faculty with good expertise in these areas that, that come in and coach you specifically on how to write an F31 or an F32. Uh, these are NR, NIH, NRSA, National Research Service Awards, pre-doctor fellowships or F32s, post-doctor fellowships. I highly recommend that you, you consider doing this. It's premature clearly in your first year, maybe your second or your third year is a good time to think about running an NIH pre-doctoral fellowship. The GPS STEM, excuse me, the uh, GFRP uh, is really appropriate for first and second year students, and that's what I'll talk about later. We have a whole bunch of training grant opportunities on this campus. You have to be working for a PI that's a trainer on that training grant. There's all kinds of activities that are being developed for trainees. Uh, rigor and responsibility of conduct of research, you know, all, all these kinds of things that are critical in your training. Um, and so there's lots of good activities there. If you're in a biomedical research area, um, you have an opportunity to potentially be on one of them. There's also other uh, sort of similar research training grants that are not NIH, Reef to Ridges, et cetera. Uh, uh, Harinder mentioned academic publication. This is critical in your career. Um, so. The Nature Master Classes program is absolutely terrific. I strongly uh, recommend that you engage in that. Um, essentially, the crux of the matter in completing your doctorate is showing that you've contributed new knowledge to the scientific body of literature, and you do that by publication. The best way to demonstrate that you've, uh, you've uh, completed your PhD and you've met that metric is academic publication. Good quality papers, Good quality journals 
it's nice to be first or second author. It's not, you know, it doesn't have to be all papers. All papers are good. First and second author papers are great. Papers in prestigious journals are good. All papers are good, you know. So anyway, that's really important. And then there's good opportunities in writing a postdoctoral fellowship, as I mentioned. And the other thing that I want to mention um, just a little bit briefly are faculty transition grants and, uh, and uh, fellowships uh, that we'll go through. So basically, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of pre-doc fellowships that you might consider depending on your research area. The NSF is generic. Anybody in a STEM field can apply for it. NIH, NRSA uh, is biomedically specific. The Ford Foundation has diversity fellowships. Uh, um, have a slide later, Graduate Division has a workshop coming up on submitting a Ford Foundation Award. Uh, this is uh, NOAA, the Atmospheric uh, Agency, uh, if you're in more physical sciences or global climate change or something like that. The EPA has fellowships. This year we've got two uh, HHMI Gilliam fellowships. These are diversity fellowships through the uh, Howard Hughes Medical uh, Program. Uh, and so there's lots of things that will come up I strongly encourage that you look for them. Uh, there's resources if you want to click on a lot of campuses have collected, you know, information on all these things. And there's a couple links here for you to, to look at. Um, the one fellowship that I want to talk about briefly here is this, uh, oh, sorry, I got the, I, the UC President's Postdoctoral Fellowship. This is something that would be appropriate to write at the end of your doctorate. Uh, you have to, there's a specific limitation when you have to engage in the postdoc and complete your PhD. Uh, it's an absolutely stunningly terrific program. It's basically designed to uh, enhance the diversity of the University of California. You write a, a proposal. If it's funded, you get to pick your UC campus and your mentor. Uh, it comes with a, a, a salary benefits, some research support. It's a one-year uh, program. It's renewable for a second. And the, the thing that makes it incredibly magnificent is it comes with an initial a perk support for an initial faculty appointment at a UC campus. It's a really great way to get a job at the University of California. They're very competitive, uh, but I want to open your eyes to some of these things now so that as you go through, you think about them. You'll see there's occasionally workshops that are available. I try to promote these. Um, either both within the department through the department graduate advisors and through mass emailings. Um, and there's also several alumni of this program that are faculty in the School of BioSci, Donovan German, Katie Pierre Thompson, I think Quasi Connor, there's probably some others that I'm forgetting. So we actually have some people that were experienced and benefited from this program and are now faculty at UCI. So really good program. This is the other one that I want to open your eyes to. Um, we, we have lots of opportunities in, you know, all kinds of careers, and I want to um, make sure that we don't lose sight of the fact that academic careers are, are, are a wonderful uh, way to proceed. You, you're going in to get the doctorate because you love science, because you love doing bench research, right? And this, you know, if you're a, a, a professor, you know, that's what you do for a living. Uh, and so the K99 is written uh, as a postdoctoral researcher, and it's meant to be a transition award to independence, right? And if you get one of these, it's another sort of like you become incredibly competitive for an assistant professor faculty position because you're coming in with money, right? You're already sort of pre-selected uh, uh, that you're going to be in a fundable situation. So this is another thing that we're also providing support with. So that's just a, a little bit about the fellowship opportunities that you're going to see available to you over the next uh, four or five years while you're a doctoral student. Now I want to talk specifically about the NSF GFR, GFRP. This is sort of an overview of what I'm going to talk about. These slides have a lot of text. There's a lot of links. They will be posted on the GPS STEM website. I'll also have, been, have it on the CMB website and the IMP website. So you'll be able to download these and get the links and stuff. So don't worry about copying stuff. It should be up later today. It may be up already, I don't know. Okay, so basically the GF, GRFP is a really great uh, fellowship program. It's designed for early career scientists 
Um, the, it, it's designed to increase STEM in, in support in early career graduate fellowships. It's designed to develop a diverse and globally engaged workforce, supports promising scientists with societal impacts. That's really important. I'll talk a bit about that as we go through. The important thing to remember when writing this, so a lot of times students in a gateway program says, I don't know what my thesis is going to be. You don't need to know. They're funding you as a scholar based on your application. They're not funding a research project. You can write it on whatever you're doing for a rotation and it can change, you know, so that's fine. One thing that I do want to point out, I don't know how relevant this is to the, this group, but uh, there was a blurb on the NSF uh, webpage, new emphasis for 2020, artificial intelligence, quantum information science, computationally intensive research. The, you know, Big data science is a, is a huge deal these days. Many of you in biological sciences do some sort of systems biology, computational biology, computationally intensive research. If that's part of what your interest is, that's a really important thing to include in your proposal this year. The, the, uh, the award is terrific. It's a five-year award. Three of those years are, are funded um, uh, financially. It's worth about 138,000. Uh, the financial support's taken over a three-year period. The stipend's 32K. It also provides 12,000 in educational allowance. You probably don't even know about that if you're an award recipient. The fees at the University of California are about 17,000. If you're in the School of BioSci, I supplement that so your PI doesn't. I consider that a perk to the PI and you for getting the award. There's also international research opportunities. There's uh, professional development uh, and federal internships, and there's access to supercomputers and things like that. The deadlines vary by discipline. The deadline in life sciences is Monday, October 19th, so about two months. So if you're going to submit a proposal this round, you need to get going on it right away. Um, eligibility, US citizens, permanent residents. Uh, I think if you're DACA and have that sort of immigration status, you're probably fine. You'll have to check on the web page. If you have serious questions about your eligibility, you can contact me. I'm going to refer you over to graduate division because they are a little more experienced in some of the nuances. It's meant for early career students. You can submit as an undergraduate, a first year or a second year graduate. And there's also um, a, a provision for students that have had a gap in their education, a two plus year gap in their education to apply. Yeah, pursuing a research-based MS or PhD, uh, you have to enroll in an accredited institution by fall 2021. Um, you will self-certify your eligibility. Th now, this is important, and I'll circle back to this. Graduate students may submit only once. They have to make a decision to submit in year one or year two. Um, you, and if you had submitted as an undergraduate, you can submit again as a graduate student, okay? So, um, this, so this is an important question. Uh, and I've been on the panel, the NSF GFP review panel, uh, three times in the past five years. Um, I signed up again for this coming year. And basically, I'm going to give you some inside insight in what it's like to be a panel member uh, that I hope will help you. And essentially, there's four categories that are, that are established. There's undergraduates, first-year grads, second-year grads, and a fourth category that have this two-year gap. And each of these groups are separately evaluated and awards are made separately within each of those, okay? Uh, so, you know, I will get the first set of applicants I get are undergraduates. The undergraduate proposals are, are they're much less sophisticated and much weaker than the graduate student suppose, proposals. And the second years are better than the first year. So there's this increasing expectation as you go through this group. Uh, so you have a really distinct advantage to apply as an undergraduate um, in, in terms of the level of competitiveness, okay? Um, and again, same for first year graduate students. So it, my, my recommendation is if you have strong broader impacts and in intellectual merit, you have an advantage as an undergraduate or a first year graduate student, okay? So what do I mean by that? So strong intellectual merit, this is just like what it sounds. What's your academic record look like? Were you an undergraduate researcher? Were you in a, perhaps you were in a big lab and got your name on a publication? Um, did you win awards? Were you, did you get, uh, you know, uh, uh, recognized at Sockness or Abercoms for a poster award? Did you receive a, a fellowship? Do you have a very high GPA? Basic academic merit. So if you have, you know, if you think you have very high academic merit, 
it's, I think you have an advantage to go in early. The NSF GRFP is critical that you have really strong, broader impacts. It's easily equal to intellectual merit. It may be more. And if you fall down on broader impacts, you will not get the award. I guarantee it. it, it so make sure that you seriously address your broader impacts in your proposal. And so, what I'm, uh, so what's broader impacts? Broader impacts is outreach to society in any way, shape, form, or manner not to a scientific community or publication or those kinds of things, but to society, community at large. So outreach to the K-12 system, diversity groups, societal community activities, those sorts of things. If you have both of these and you're entering your first year, I think you have a substantial advantage over a second year student, okay? So that's what I want you to think about. And of course, that's a decision that you have to make. If you are going to wait a year and apply for during your the beginning of your second year, you can do some things. All right, develop a strong research proposal. Have a really great first year. Get rotations. Occasionally, first year students get publications. Maybe you had work from an undergraduate experience that will get published in the meantime. Those are really strong indications that of your intellectual merit. Okay. Uh, you have an opportunity to develop and engage in broader impacts. Okay. Again, one of the things that the reviewers look for is strong and consistent broader impacts. I know when I read uh, a, a, an application that ha talks about their broader impacts, if there hasn't been a trend that they can, that they can identify in their proposal and their background information and so on, that leads you to believe that they're going to continue to do this, I kind of go, ah, come on, you're not really, you know, dedicated to broader impacts. So this, you know, if you're going to wait a year, you can have some opportunities to do things. You don't want to spend a lot of time doing this. You want a high impact, easy to do uh, activities. And I have recommendations towards the end of the talk. Okay. Um, okay. Resources. I actually surfed around a little bit in preparing this talk and I was impressed with the GFRP red page. And I, I sort of took some screenshots and put them here, but there's some really good recommendations. I recommend that if you're going to look through it, go through, you know, I, I highlighted tips here and it just gives you some good information about how to prepare a proposal. Also, there's a thing for reference writers. I'll talk about letter writers as I go through too, but this is a great resource. You'll have to use this for your application, but I encourage you to take a, a good look at it. Um, the campus has central activities run through graduate division. There's a dedicated employee, uh, uh, Dr. Kaylee Anderson Natale. Uh, she's available uh, by email, uh, so on. Uh, you can make appointments with her. There's virtual NSF Q&A and drop-in hours that she hosts two to four on October 8th, October 12th. There's a, a workshop on writing fellowships. There's a workshop on the Ford Fellowship on October 28th. And then there's uh, NSF writing and review sessions uh, that are recorded and hosted. So these are, I had to contact Kaylee personally in order to get the schedule. It should be coming out like today. So I will try to forward that around, but look for that. You'll see uh, communication from graduate division on these kinds of things. And I think these are good activities. Um, from the school side and for, I do this for the School of Biosci and primarily the School of Medicine other people are welcome to participate. Um, there will be a, a, a list of current NSF GFP recipients that are willing to assist applicants in proposal preparation. We used to do this in person. We won't be doing it in person this year. So I'm just gonna try to hook you up remotely so that you can, um, you know, you can take a look at that. And Gary Roman has recent applications that were funded and successful that you can look at for, um, you know, for uh, guidance about what a successful program uh, proposal looks like. Okay, so what does it take? You have a personal uh, 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 statement uh, that includes relevant background future goals. There's a graduate research statement. This is the research proposal part of it. You've got transcripts. You've got to upload them. You need at least three letters of recommendation. I'll talk about that in a minute. And there may be some other eligibility issues, right? So it's pretty easy. Five pages of text. Okay, that's not a lot of writing. It's also not a lot of writing. Every sentence counts, okay? The review criteria. There's two criteria that a panel member uh, evaluates for an application. Intellectual merit, it encompasses basically how will this 
proposal, advanced scientific knowledge, and then broader impacts. And this is how will this scholar contribute to benefit society and improve societal outcomes? And I'll talk a little bit more about these. One of the most important things that I want you to do in preparing the proposal is make it really simple for the, for the uh, reviewer to know what is your intellectual merit and what is your broader impact. Um, I get probably 40 applications to review, 10 in each of the four categories, you know, and I'll sit down and I'll rip through them. And if I read your two page statement and I don't know what your intellectual merit and your broader impacts are, you, you're not in a good situation. So make it really simple. Use bolded headlines. You, you can use, um, you can use uh, um, bullets or uh, bolded sections or something like that, but use the terms intellectual merit and broader impacts either directly in a heading or in a sentence that's bolded or something like that. Make it really simple for the reviewer to understand. Intellectual merit, uh, potential to advance knowledge. Basically, the, 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 you'll be reviewed on your academic record. How strong is it? Proposed plan of research. Make it really simple. You want to clearly state your hypothesis. You probably need an introductory paragraph to introduce the, the area. And then there should be a clear statement of what you're going to try to learn, what you're going to try to test. Okay. And it's okay to write, my hypothesis is. You can bold it if you want. And then you want to talk about your experimental approach and the impact uh, interpretation. Right. Uh, you want to include your research experience in terms of publications, presentations, references. Um, I, I copied some of the, the metrics that they recommend that we look at. I highlighted in blue the ones I personally find most compelling. Your research experience. So we want to see people that have dedicated some part of their life already to being a research scientist. How have they done academically? This is not only an academic coursework, but how have they done in research? Some of this may be simply how you state it. What did you study? What did you learn? What was the outcome? And it may also be based on presentations and uh, potentially uh, publications. Who are your references? How do they talk about you? Um, if you have publications I talked about, leadership is important. If you've taken leadership roles, it, you know, training other undergraduates while you were an undergraduate researcher, um, going to uh, you know, a, 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 another research one university for a summer for an eight week program for an NSF REU or, or something like that. Those all show that you have wings to fly on and that sort of stuff. As scientists, what we like to see is creativity and innovation, right? And so that's important if you can, if you can portray that in your, in, your, um, in your communication. Broader impacts, potential benefit to society. Now, the, one of the important things in broader impacts is you need to be specific. If you did something, talk about exactly what it was. Was it a program run by a larger group? And what did you do? Okay, make it really clear and simple. Again, at the end of uh, the, the reviewer reading your text, do you want them to know, oh yeah, Jessica Noche Lingat, you know, did this while she was an undergraduate in, in this program, right? And it allows me to identify uh, something that, you, you know, that specifically that you did. Uh, then, and, and having a history portends an outcome later. So, uh, the personal and professional activities, educational, academic experiences, previous and continuing contributions are critical. And you can put some of your, 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 your you personally into this. Um, uh, women in mathematics, for example, you know, there's not a lot of women in mathematics and physics. Uh, it's also true in the rest of STEM. I don't mean to, you know, denigrate that at all. But, you know, they could talk about, you know, they, they, many of them talk about what are they doing for women? What are they doing for diversity students? Some of them go back to their home demographic, you know, and, uh, and engage K-12 systems in Santa Ana or in Garden Grove or whatever that might be. Um, you want to be specific. Now, again, as scientists, we as reviewers, we like creativity and innovation. So if I write, I'm going to go to K-12 classrooms and talk about my thesis research. Hey, that's great. That's been done 10,000 times, right? It's nothing wrong with it, but it's just not very clever and innovative, right? If you can have something that's different, 
there's value in that. So I always tell this story, it's a bit unique. I once reviewed an application from a young woman who had a sibling who was deaf and she could sign, right? And her broader impacts was she was bring, gonna bring signs to the deaf, right? And she could was in a unique position to do that as a graduate student because she could sign, right? I can't sign, I can't do that. I thought, hey, that's really, that's really great. Um, given that she could sign, it's not terribly clever, but it's a really high impact and it's different, right? So that's one that I remember from over the years that I, I thought was really good. But think about what it is that you do. So if you're in neuroscience, there's huge opportunity for you to talk about neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, you know, things like that. If you're a virologist, you can, you can blog about COVID, right? Or, you know, you can do all kinds of things. If you're an immunologist, you understand, you know, uh, uh, the, the immunotherapies for, for COVID. I can't think of the right words. I'm sorry. And so draw on your affinities, draw on your, your research interests and make something that's really good. And you'll get high, you'll get high grades on broader impacts. The, ease, the, the way the students fail, a lot of students are really smart. They're really good. They're highly engaged, but they fall down on broader impacts. Don't short the broader impacts. Um, okay, I'm going to go through this quickly because I just talked about all this stuff. There are all kinds of things that you can do. Outreach at K-12, you get, you kids are all, you, you know, social network savvy and all that kind of stuff. You can blog and you can create a Reddit channel. You can outreach to community. There's lots of good resources in neuroscience. I'll talk about later through the CNLM and uh, activities for students to come in, but think about what it is that you can do uh, and, you know, and then make it, again, make it unique and make it cool. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to move forward on this. And then the, the, the three-page statement is your per personal and background uh, and future goals. This is an opportunity to talk about who you are and how you got there. Uh, big deal in science today is overcoming obstacles in your academic pathway. What were your struggles? Did you have to work at a community college before getting into a Cal State and getting into a, a program? There's all kinds of stories that you can tell. You want to portray the love of science, your dedication to science, those kinds of things. Oops, I'm sorry. And then uh, you want to talk about your research. You want to talk about it positively. Include information about what were your challenges, what were your struggles, those kinds of things. What did you learn? How was that, um, uh, how was that uh, played out? I got here. Hi, Mike. For broader impacts, would you say it's best to narrow this narrative to maybe two or three examples? Yes. I would be. So what you don't want is you don't want this glossy overview that you know, it's like not specific. You want two or three or even one or two really clear, strong examples of what you did. Be specific and talk about the impact. How were the students affected? Was there a particular student that you convinced to go on to the university? You know, those kinds of things. So, um, and again, make it, make it simple, you know, highlight the, those sections and make it really clear. Um, with the research plan, you want to make sure your research question is well stated. And then you go into research proposal mode. You may not have experience with this, but you've probably seen a lot of it. You should be working with a faculty member on this. You want to talk, you want to introduce with a rationale, talk about a general approach, why that's, to talk about your experimental design. Scientists are all deep down inside experimentalists, so they like to see that experiments are well planned controls, positive controls, negative controls, things that you know would work, you know, unique resources that you may have access to. You want to address your timeline. Don't be so grandiose that, you know, it's not something that's feasible in a doctorate. You should think about this as something that would be feasible in a three, four, five year period as a doctoral student. Expected outcomes. It's always important to address pitfalls and caveats, alternative strategies. If you can Corroborate something using a completely independent approach. That's always wonderful. You will want both intellectual merit and broader impacts in both the, the personal statement and the research plan. Okay. Um, avoid jargon. Uh, I know I get, you know, I'm a plant molecular biologist. I review in proteomics, genomics, um, uh, and uh, sort of uh, uh, genetics, right? You know, I don't, I'm not a mammalian cancer biologist. If you start with a lot of, you know, signal transduction and transcription factors, that's not 
that's not my language. Make sure it's clear and simple. You want to communicate. That's your primary goal. Make it clear and simple. Don't short shrift the science, but make it clear and easy to understand. Um, and then at the end, you want to address the potential research advantage and, uh, and benefit to society. Letter writers are critical, okay? Um, if you have a, you should use your previous research advisors from undergraduate, from a first year rotation, you know, your current advisor, um, people that were involved with recruitment to UCI. Uh, other choices, if you happen to know uh, faculty that are directors of uh, research units or centers, training grant directors, distinguished senior faculty. Um, I think there's a tendency for students that are working in a prestigious faculty member's lab to get the award. Um, it, you know, is, is one way people get it, you know, because they have all these great resources. You're required to have three letters. If you don't have three letters, you're out, okay? So please ask for at least four, maybe five, okay? Letters are due October 30th, 2020, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Right? End of discussion. If they're not in, they're not in. Your proposal does not get reviewed. Um, for the letter writer, what I want you to do is develop maybe a one or two sentence statement of your intellectual merit and your broader impacts. I want you to label them intellectual merits and broader impacts and succinctly state what they are and request that the letter writer include that in their letter, okay? That makes it really easy for the letter writer to emphasize, you know, this, this is what I want at the end, the, 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 the uh, reviewer to, to see, okay? Um, the application review, this is sort of inside information based on my experience. So as I mentioned, I'm a plant molecular biologist. I do genetics and I do some real uh, entry level genomics. I do, I'm a trained as an enzymologist and biochemist. We do a little structural biology. I can get, you know, a proposal that's in fish genomics, right? I mean, it, it's got some sort of, a, you know, environmental a, a aspect to it, you know? And, and the, the onus is on the applicant to communicate to me, right? That's, that's all that matters is that I get it, right? So be really clear, make it simple and easy to understand. You're in four areas. You're gonna be a first or second year graduate student. Uh, you're individually reviewed by three panel members. This is blind. We submit numbers. You never see those numbers. It's, there's a statistical algorithm that NSF uses to normalize them. And then uh, your, your application, and, and then there, you're marked separately on intellectual merit and broader impacts, okay? And then the reviewer will write a very succinct statement for each of those categories. Succinct statement, maybe two sentences, maybe three sentences, maybe one sentence. It's really short, you don't get a lot of feedback. Um, and then if the numbers are tight, then I think they, they sort of say, oh, it's a consensus. If there's disparate numbers, it can go out for discussion. And when that happens, I, I will go to a, a webinar and then we'll have a breakout and I'll go with three other people. And then there'll be a lead, a secondary, a third. And then we'll talk about the, the application. And sometimes I change my mind and sometimes I don't. You know, and then I get the opportunity to change my score so that they try to develop a good consensus. I think it's a relatively fair process. Um, the you as an applicant will receive anonymous copies of the reviews. So you should get a review for each of the categories from the three reviewers. And then I as a panelist make recommendations, numerical scores, then it's gone. I never see it again. I never know what happens. NSF makes the awards and um, no one ever talks to me again, and I am always, you know, and when I'm all done, I kind of look back and go, gee, I really like this, but when I look at the overall score, I go, oh, they're probably not going to get it. It's really competitive, but it's really worth doing, okay? Now, one of the things that I want to address with this group is the uh, uh, application in biomedical research, right? So NSF doesn't fund biomedical research, right? But in this sense, for the pre-doctoral fellowships, they're funding scholars. They're funding scholars that are, you know, they feel will be, have superior intellectual merit and will contribute to societal. So basically, and many of the students that we have that work on extremely biomedical things like cancer biology um, win the award, right? And there's, so there's a way to handle it, okay? Emphasize in the research proposal the basic scientific principles 
that you're studying. So for example, if you're studying cancer, maybe there's a perturbation in signal transduction, right? Cell cycle, you know, whatever. Uh, talk about that. Talk about the cell biology. Talk about the molecular biology of the disrupted pathway, right? Do not talk about disease-related aspects like drug development, therapies, clinical work, things along that lines. Now, so, and so, you know, in, in some cases in cancer biology, that might be a pretty easy thing to do. Um, I had, I know one of the professors works in addiction, uh, had a student write a proposal, and he contacted me and said, uh, how do I talk about addiction in a way that's not like, you know, biomedically relevant? I was like, I don't know, <laughs> you know, anyway. Um, so I think that's the best advice. And I've asked some of the panel members to address this as we go through. So, but I, you, you, the students do it successfully, right? And so uh, please do not decide not to apply because, oh, I'm in a biomedical research area. You are eligible for, for this award uh, no matter what. Okay, now I'm gonna go through these slides really quickly. This is meant for you afterwards to go and click around and see if there's any of these things that you wanna engage in. There's a bunch of outreach activities that are here at UCI. Cosmos is a summer program, camps a program, rocket science tutors, um, Tech Trek, Math Camp for Girls, uh, Graduate Division Decade Program is a way to engage in diversity activities. Uh, there's, there's other kinds of activities here. Take a look at what UCI has to offer. If you can participate in an organized program, it's easy for you to engage. It's high quality engagement and it doesn't, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel in order to do outreach. There's lots of uh, activities within the School of BioSci. Uh, Center for Learning Arts Sciences, Sciences and Sustainability, Science Fair Initiative. Uh, there's lots of local schools, um, Irvine, as well as Costa Mesa and Garden Grove, and you know other schools that have uh, that want students to come and be science judges. And there's lots of K-12 outreach opportunities. The CLNLM has lots of good activities. They're organized. They have people coming in on weekends. If you're a neuroscience, it's a really easy way to participate. You can be a docent. There's a brain awareness week, um, and you can you should go follow up with people in the Center for uh, Neurobiology and Learning and Memory uh, for more of those kinds of activities. And then there's outreach activities in physical sciences, leaps, undergraduate mentoring. I collected these over the years. Um, and then there's lots of things in Orange County, Aquarium of the Pacific, Newport Bay Conservancy, et cetera, et cetera. There's all kinds of things that you could do if those are things that make sense for you, the, whatever, what you're doing in broader impacts should be at least loosely, you know, correlated with your scientific interests. Um, and then I'm gonna give you a few examples of applicant reviews. Now, I collected these a few years ago and I collected reviews of a student that submitted in the first year and then resubmitted in the second year. You can no longer do this. So these are a few years old, but they emphasize basically what I have been telling you about the review criteria. Reviewer number one, intellectual merit good. Research plan would have been strengthened if written in a hypothesis driven manner rather than a descriptive one, right? S simply state your hypothesis. Keep it simple, make it easy to understand. No specific mention of what hypotheses are to be tested. No mention of challenges or problems that might be expected. Things that I addressed. That was first submission, second submission. Uh, same, same student, second year, applicant has many strengths, included academic success, previous research experience, pilot data, productivity of the applicant, the quality and relevance of the hypothesis-driven research proposal. They got the message and they corrected it. You don't have the advantage of submitting the award and not getting it and resubmitting in, in the new uh, structure. So, you got to do it right the first time. Applicant brings useful background in biophysical chemistry to longstanding problem, neuroscience, strong set of quantitative skills, great advantage. Sounds a little better than good to me, but the student got the award. Um, another example on broader impacts. Applicant presents a limited history of outreach by the standards of this competition. The bars are high, okay? So, you know, if you, you know, if you don't short shrift the broader impacts. You gotta bring your A game to this. If you don't, you're not gonna get the award. Uh, such, uh, the applicant was strengthened and involved in chemistry demos. Leadership roles are needed to make the application of competitive 
and oh, I'm sorry. Oh, ah. Let me go back. I, 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 I hit my cursor and it went, um, okay. Uh, that was, okay. Um, then this one, however, applicant does not show evidence of significant leadership and contributions to encouraging diversity or integrating re research and education. And the next year, in particular, their participation at Reddit Science is an excellent way to provide science information and excitement to the general public, okay? When I read this, I didn't know what Reddit was. <laughs> okay, I actually, it's a, it's a little bit of a funky social network for my taste, but I actually get on occasionally because it's got lots of broad interests. You can read about fishing or surfing or, you know, all kinds of things. And anyway, applicant has shown leadership in these areas, right? So that's basically what I wanted to present. I'm going to stop my share. I'm going to go back and um, let me look at the group chat very, very briefly. I want to move on to my panelists right now, but very briefly, is there anything in group chat? I, I, I responded earlier to, uh, uh, there was a private group chat about broader impacts. Anything quickly or should I just turn it over? Okay, I'm going to turn it over. And the first person up on my screen is Jessica Noche Lingad. And she's a doctoral student in Craig Stark's lab in neurobiology and behavior came in with the INP program. And uh, Jessica, go ahead and talk a little bit about, you know, whatever you think would be useful to the applicants. Sure, yeah. So first thing is um, your presentation is pretty much unchanging every year. Uh, it's, it's really formulaic in the way you need to prepare your application. Um, so with when I was preparing, I followed every single point that you presented. Um, in the presentation, and I feel like that that helped like tremendously. Uh, my my markings on the reviews were all excellent except for one very good. Um, and the criticism for that one was because I didn't in my research proposal um, talk about what kind of statistics I might use and how many uh, what size my sample size was. Um, but those kinds of details, you it'll be really helpful if you go over your. Um, research proposal with your PI um, because they they know all of those little details for you know when they write grants and if they can share with you their R01s or whatever grants they have you can get a good idea of how you might want to frame your application. Um, there's a lot of people on this panel so I'm just going to kind of go through the main bullet points that I wanted to emphasize. So first read the entire solicitation uh, before you start. I also gave myself about three months to write. I wrote maybe two to three hours a day on most days. It was a little uh, of an overkill if I spent any time more than that because the very next day I'd scrap it and just write something different. So just spend a, you know, a couple hours a day. Um, another key thing for me is huge. It was to have two different people read my draft. One person who is not in my field to um, be able to get the gist of the research, which could very well be the kind of profile your reviewer will be, someone who's totally not in your field. And then also find someone who is in your field, maybe like a um, you know, project scientist in your lab or a staff member who can give you feedback on, or hopefully your PI if they have time, but um, who can give you feedback on the scientific rigor of your proposal. And also like what Dr. Mulligan said, it doesn't have to be exactly what you're gonna do for your thesis. I'm totally not doing what I proposed in my um, in my proposal, but but it's fine. Um, and also give your letter writers about a month, so give them a heads up, and then prepare all those materials that Mike suggested. Um, I'm one of those people who my research is is sort of you know biomedical uh, focused. Uh, I study Alzheimer's disease and I look at biomarkers with neuroimaging. But I really emphasize the importance of understanding the underlying mechanisms of memory and um, how they go awry in different conditions like Alzheimer's disease. And then I talk about the uh, specifically Alzheimer's disease in only the broader impact sections and in the intellectual merit. Uh, you should have those two sections in both documents. So it should be in your research proposal and in your personal statement. Um, and then also I did all the bolding and underlining and all of that. Um, uh, I think that's about it. I'm trying to be really quick here. There's a bunch of us. So um, I'll turn it over to the next panelist, but um, I'll, I'll drop my email if anyone wants to look at my application materials. I can send Thanks, it Jessica. 
So thank you for the kind words. <laughs> and then, uh, Thanks for the tips. <laughs> yeah. um, so the next one on my screen is Kristen Gabriel. Uh, she, I was on her prelim exam, I think, in her first year. She was in the CMB, and she went to Greg Weiss's lab, and she's a terrific student. I actually read her proposal, too, before she submitted it. So anyway, Kristen, go ahead. Talk about your experience. You did. OK. Hi, everyone. Kristen Gabriel, I'm a fifth year. In terms of my experience with the NSF GRFP, I applied um, first time as an undergraduate. And that time, I felt like I had strong, broader impacts, um, but my science was lacking, and partly because I didn't let um, a lot of people review it. I had maybe one or two professors to go off of, and that wasn't really their area of expertise. I would say the main like reviewer comments um, for that like, intellectual merit part was I needed to have like, clear objectives. Um, I needed to have more detailed experimental methods and then have alternative, alternative procedures. So I took those reviewer comments and I've incorporated them into the second time I applied and that was during my second year grad school. I decided to hold off on my first year and get some more writing experience and just learn more how to talk about science. And I felt like that really paid off for me applying to my second year. And just um, echoing some of the things that were um, mentioned before um, by, um, was it Jessica? Um, she talked about like Mike's presentation and kind of going through all those points. I just wanted to emphasize a few things that he talked about. Um, one of them is the um, letter of recommendation writers. I asked for um, professors to write letters and um, I'm glad that I asked for because one of them submitted, I'm not kidding, within like 50 minutes of the deadline an application. So it was kind of like pretty nerve wracking to have that experience. So I would like highly recommend reaching out to four reference writers. And like Jessica mentioned, do it a month before. And then similar what Mike talked about, you know, you kind of attach your latest draft and tell them, hey, I'm working on this. But the last email, you know, pick two to three sentences from intellectual merits and then broader impacts and have, you know, have it almost like they could like copy and paste that and like that's what you want them to communicate. It really makes it easier for them to write a letter of recommendation based on what you want to tailor. And I spent the time for each professor uh, making sure that they can talk about different aspects of my intellectual merit and broader research so that if you look at, you know, all three of them together, they would talk about different things um, in terms of my experience. Okay, and then the other um, thing that I wanted to touch upon that I found was extremely helpful. Um, Mike told me to um, like be able to demonstrate your history. You want to say, I've done this in the past and I will continue or I've continued to do this now. So being consistent with your um, like broader impacts um, is something that I I've done too. Just in undergrad, I was a part of, you know, women in science and then did the same thing here in grad school. Um, and I think that was it in terms of um, like going off of what Mike said. I just have a few more um, like pieces of advice. So in terms of timeline, like I started now. And what I started doing in August, I did some brainstorming to think about and like why I wanted to be a scientist and like how I wanted to make an impact in society. And I thought about those like two big questions for some time and that helped me with my personal statement. I talked about being you know, a first gen uh, college student and how I also wanted to kind of inspire and impact um, that community to bring more first gens you know, in STEM. And then after I did some brainstorming, I personally need to have um, like be held accountable by meeting with someone else. And I scheduled like weekly writing meetings with the writing consultants at the Graduate Center. 
And this helped me with my personal statement. I brought in a really rough draft. Okay, but that first meeting helped me figure out how to tell my story and it wasn't um, like chronologically, it was more kind of mixed up and grouped in terms of say research experience in you know undergrad and then research experience in like interns and work experience. Um, and then let's see, there's one other thing that I wanted to mention um, in terms of the application itself, try to use their language that they have up on the website. And then my helpful tip that I have for you is before you submit, um, make sure you like, print out your application because the, it does this really weird thing where if you have like quotes or something, it will turn them into question marks and the formatting looks really weird. So I would suggest you uh, suggest that you you know print it out to get a visual of what your reviewer is going to see. And that's that's it in terms of tips. And if you um, would like me to like share my materials or anything, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thanks, Kristen. So uh, yeah, like I said, at least for letter writers. And then I think Kristen brought up something clever. I know. Uh, other students have also sort of got different people from different parts of their background to write letters so that they sort of represent something slightly different, you know, so undergraduate researcher, maybe somebody that knew you because you were a TA or something like that, you know, and, and, and then I think some students have actually slightly, you know, massaged the, the succinct statements to the different people. So they automatically come out different. So actually, I think that that's a really good idea. And the other thing is, you know, you can't trust faculty to get a letter in on time. So you can set, tell them a month in advance and they won't do it, okay? It's a good idea to tell them a month in advance, but you know, you, you need to prompt them a week in advance, five days in advance, three days in advance and make sure they get that in, right? So anyway, but thank you, Kristen. Next up I have on my screen is Tiffany Bartese, and she's a graduate student in EcoEvo in Brandon Gott's lab. And I think you do some kind of genomics, don't you, Tiffany? Yeah, so evolution using uh, microbial systems. So yeah, thank you. So yes, I'm starting my fifth year now in uh, Brandon Gott's lab, and I was awarded the NSF uh, GRFP in 2018. I applied my second year of graduate school, and that was the only time I applied. Um, I feel like we've heard a lot of really good advice and tips so far from Jessica and Kristen, so thank you. Those are all really super detailed and helpful. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my experience writing the personal statement and the statement. Of course, it will be different from person to person, but maybe this will help you. For me, I was really worried about the limits, the page limits. So, you know, three and two pages is not a lot of space. Um, so, although that was something that I really worried about when I started writing, I just made sure, I just wrote and I wrote everything that I wanted to have and so although like the personal statement ended up being like five pages I feel like from there it made it really easy for me to see what was the things that I wanted to highlight and to keep and what are some stuff I could cut. Um, I ended up keeping mine in chronological order but I've seen some other successful NSF GRFPs and we've heard here too that it doesn't have to be in chronological order um, but that's a good way also, I think, to see it too. If you're worried about the page limits or something, don't worry too much. If you, you know, start now, you'll have time to cut it and everything later. Um, I also want to emphasize having people to read it. And so we've been, uh, we've um, heard that advice too, but it's a really important thing. Um, I, I know this sounds weird because I did get the award, but I definitely, if I could do something different, I would make sure I had more people read it just so I could feel more confident. Of course, too many different ideas could also be a bad thing, but you know, having people from like my committee or something like that would have been really good also to read it. I ended up having, of course, my PI read it um, and then also going to the Graduate Resource Center also to help me out with that too. And I think that's a good, um, definitely good resource as well. Um, another thing I would want to mention is that I think it's also important to kind of connect your personal statement and your research statement in a way. So something that I did was I had some preliminary results for my project I was proposing in my research statement, and I included those results actually in my personal statement. Um, so that is something that you could do if you'd like to keep it, um, show that they're connected. And also since you have only two pages in the research statement, you can highlight that this is an experiment that you have results for 
you know that you can do what you're claiming in the research experiment and it'll help connect them. Um, I'd also say too for your personal statement if you're talking about previous research projects you've worked on to try to um, go from like beginning to end for the research to show that you can um, see a project through so mention briefly your question or hypothesis any results that you might have and then depending on if you presented that work or published that work so you want to be able to show that you if you have research experience that you've been able to see projects through the end before um, and then again yeah i totally made use of bolding um, certain headers so in my personal statement and in the research statement i bolded my entire hypothesis and bolded different sections in my research statement to denote the different aims, the experiments, if, um, limitations and alternative approaches. I had those headers bolded, so it was easy to, I, I hoped it was easy to see and to read it. Um, yeah, and then for, um, I feel like a lot of things have been covered, it's been great. And so the other thing too, for the broader impacts, um, I had I, a full page written for broader impacts and that's something that I think you want to aim for maybe even longer for sure too if you have that um, but you want to de devote a good amount of your personal statement to broader impacts and really um, describing that you don't want to leave too small of a chunk or not really describe that in too much in, in not enough detail um, but yeah I feel like we've heard a lot of really good advice and a lot of the things I had written down has already been covered so I think I'll wrap up for there Thanks, Tiffany. That's terrific. Um, next up, I have Kevin Cabrera. He's in Zeba Wunderlich's lab in Devon Cell, and he's a genomics guy. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, I appreciated the German pronunciation there, uh, <laughs> <from> speaker. <laughs> um, so I applied in my second year as a grad student, and I got the award in 2019. Um, I actually had both Tiffany and Kristen read my application when I was writing it. So, you know, it's kind of come full circle. It's really fun there. Um, they, a lot of really great advice has been given. So I'm just gonna highlight a couple of key points. I looked over some of the application materials that I submitted, as well as some of the feedback that I got from the reviewers. And I wanna highlight some of the big things that they emphasized. The first one is uh, highlight independence in research. So especially when you're talking about your undergraduate research experience, it's great that you did the work that you did, but you know, talk about what you did alone, right? Not just, oh, I worked under a grad student or I've just done this. Show, show instances where you took initiative, where you designed experiments and you saw projects through. Um, one big thing is when you're writing this uh, application, these essays, think about what makes you different, right? What makes you stand out from the hundreds of applications that these people are gonna to have to read? What are your specific set of skills? What's something that you can do that you know you do better than somebody else? And beef it up, right? If you're, especially if you're gonna apply your second year, you're not gonna apply your first year, hone in on those skills and try to commit to activities that hone in on those skills and emphasize why you're good at that. Um, to this point also, I'd say choose an angle and stick to it, right? These essays can become very generic after a while, especially after reading like a bunch of them. And if you're generic, you're going to get moved to the bottom of the pile, right? Choose an angle in your essay. The best essays always do. And highlight this as a theme, both through your research proposal, as well as your personal statement. For example, on mine, I really emphasize a lot uh, science communication and science education. I used to be a theater kid in high school and all through college. And I said, well, that makes me different than other scientists. I'm the theater kid scientist. So what am I good at? I'm good at communicating things. And I chose that angle and I stuck to it. And in all of my reviews, all of the reviewers said like, you know, it's really obvious what this kid is about. And like in the broader impacts, it was like right in my face about it. So there was no doubt on what was going on in my application. Um, make your research obvious and pithy. You know, you can get very lost in a lot of the technical methods, especially if you're going to write a computation based um, Project proposal kind of like how I did don't get lost in the codes and stuff. If you have a non programming person. They are not going to get what you're talking about. They're not interested in what analysis software you're going to use make all your research obvious like, oh, of course, he's going to be doing this experiment to look at this thing. Of course, she's going to be doing this researchers like to feel smart so make your committee feel smart when they're reading your thing and make it really obvious um commit to the big picture of your research especially for your broader impacts 
Um, I work with insects and I've worked with insects since undergrad. So I talk about why insects are important in my broader impacts. Why bother doing research on these like really gross things? I mean, it has a huge impact on agriculture and two of my three reviewers pinpointed that when reviewing my broader sections, like, oh yeah, of course we're gonna look at insects. Um, also include alternative approaches for your research. So talk about, you know, oh, I'm gonna do this, but also keep in the back of your mind and also underlying your writing. What happens if it doesn't work the way you think it does, right? What happens if you do this experiment, you do like an RNA-seq experiment and there's no differences? What does that mean for your research? Make your approach foolproof, right? Think about if I don't get the result that I want, I'm still gonna learn something. And that is good advice for any sort of grant or fellowship you write for any research proposal. Always think like a pessimist, it'll make you a good scientist. Um, uh, let's see, the last thing, two, two last points. Uh, one, find the right committee you're gonna submit to. So I submitted to the genomics division for reviewing my application. My project was also uh, immunology based. But I knew that I'm, my forte lies in the genomics and not the immunology. So, you know, submit to whatever committee you think is going to really work to your advantage when reviewing your application. I knew if I submitted to immunologists, it may not be as like punchy. It may not be as exciting to them, my research. Um, and the last thing is have the right number of people read your application. Don't leave it at just one. Don't leave it at 50 right? Um, you want to have more than one person. And I also agree, definitely get someone that's outside of your immediate field to read your application. Does it still make sense to them? Um, but also it gets to a point you could reach like a critical mass where too many cooks spoil the stew. And then like you, your voice will get drowned out if you have a billion people read your application. So find like a good middle ground where you still have your voice in your essay, but still have enough feedback that realistically it'll have mass appeal. So um, I think that's all the major points I wanted to hit. Great uh, technical advice, I think, and you know, sort of putting together a proposal. Thank you, Kevin. Carissa, Carissa Munoz was in the School of Medicine in an immunology lab. And I remember she called me the day it was to be submitted because she was concerned about how her advisor's letter was addressing biomedical research. So, and she's in Christine Sudelman's lab and in Devon's cell now. So Carissa, go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm now going to be a fifth year. Um, I applied to NSF in my second year. And yes, Mike, thank you for reminding me that. I almost forgot about that. Uh, I, I had to really work on my application to make sure that my project wasn't highlighting too many like medical aspects. Um, for example, like I was working on like mouse models for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And rather than say that, I didn't include anything about a mouse model. Instead, I focused on saying, I'm looking at muscle regeneration and just on a cellular level, how muscles can like grow, what are the different growth factors required for that? So I really had to like work on that. And it was, it was a little bit like, it was challenging working with my PI because he was like, no, I'm like excited about these mouse models. This is what we're doing. But I had to kind of pull away and like really make um, some like executive decisions with like my with my writing and, and just make sure that I was appealing to more of like a broad, um, basic level science um, audience. Um, I would say thank you for everyone for sharing all of your, your points. I'm not gonna try to, I don't wanna like repeat anything, but one thing that I would say is that it's a little bit challenging to brag about yourself, but you really kind of have to do that on these applications because everyone is so great and has so much to offer and it's really competitive but don't be afraid to tell them how good you are because how are they going to know how good you are unless you tell them they don't know you on a personal level so don't be afraid to say this is my strength i'm really good at communicating i really enjoy xyz you can clearly like state that and list that and be confident about it and that will come out in your writing don't be too cocky or like be careful with the language but i think your confidence in your writing will definitely be something that will make you stand out. And um, they will like to fund someone who they think will be able to uh, like be a confident scientist and be able to be a good ambassador because that's what you are eventually. Like if you get the award, you are a representative for them and you will then have other opportunities as an NSF fellow to apply to um, other smaller awards or other like international 
events. And there was actually, when I got the award, they had a an event in LA, like a meetup for all the, the NSF um, fellows. I don't know if they still do that, probably not anymore because of COVID, but we got to meet other people. So like the whole point is not just to be like good at the bench, but like good as like an overall human being, someone who likes to communicate science and someone who can be like personable and relatable and not just like, you know, tunnel vision. So I think, um, I think that's pretty much it. Like remind your professors, give them plenty of notice, give them a million emails. It's okay if you're a little annoying with the emails, they will appreciate it later on and at least you'll get your stuff in on time. <laughs> so <laughs> don't be afraid to email them a million times. If you have any more like specific questions, you can email me. I, I left my email in the, in the chat, but I think pretty much everything has already been covered and discussed. Thank you, Carissa. And my, the last uh, panelist is Lindsay uh, Hosahama. And I got to know her her first year. She came from an epigenetics lab at UCLA. And she's in Marion Waterman's lab. And they do uh, cancer biology. So she's a good person that can talk about the biomedical research angles. Uh, so Lindsay, go ahead. Yeah, um, listening to Carissa kind of explain like how she was deciding what to write about the research proposal. I kind of had a very similar situation. So I'll kind of start with that first. Um, I'm in a cancer lab. My PI is the head of the Cancer Research Institute here, but we're also kind of interested on, you know, basic mechanisms such as like when signaling as well as, you know, stem cells in the gut and how they function, which isn't necessarily like a disease related model. Um, but my project specifically was very cancer focused. And so um, since another part of our lab was kind of trying to understand stem cells. A lot of our lab meetings and group discussions were about just how regeneration happens in the gut. And it's something that I find super fascinating. It's like as fascinating as cancer. And so um, I was actually really excited to write about something that had nothing to do with my project. Um, it was kind of fun in the sense that I really just proposed something without the limitations of like, oh God, do I actually have to do this? Um, I kind of proposed some pretty crazy stuff. Um, like making this crazy transgenic mouse and then doing tons of like ATAC sequencing on, on different cell types. Um, and so in the end, I, I, um, I knew that the project I would have to work on, even if I got funding, was the one that, you know, my PI wanted me to, but I really got to play around with the proposal. And so um, for like kind of timeline, I ended up, um, I spent about a month like solidifying my aims and really deciding like, what I really kind of wanted to get at and my hypothesis. Um, and then when I kind of, once I solidified that, I spent another solid month writing, you know, reading and writing every day. And I was lucky to kind of have the blessing of my PI to take it easy at the bench and just really focus on this. This is um, another graduate student in our lab, you know, was also awarded. And I, I don't know if my PI was just like, kind of was willing to, for that compromise um, if I got, you know, cause the funding you get, you know, helps your lab out a lot it's like three years of your salary which is you know salaries are quite substantial cost for a lab um so i was really lucky my pi was okay with me like you know really focusing on this and i, I just every day all day i read and wrote and read and wrote and read and wrote and um so i was i was pretty lucky with that um i asked for i asked four different faculty for letters uh but once the first three that i you rank them so once the first three had submitted them i kind of told the fourth person like you don't have to submit anywhere don't worry about it um and i think um you know one of the questions that we had was um you know from erica wh who to ask for letters of rec so since i had done i was a lab tech after undergrad and i had a really good relationship with my old pi she was one of my letter writers. Um, my current PI is another one. And then um, what I proposed for the, for the science, I was gonna maybe make a crazy transgenic mouse. So actually another one of my mentors, um, who's the director of the transgenic mouse facility here at UCI wrote me another letter. And uh, it was nice because he actually commented on me as a student as well as me you know, in this project. Um, and just really so, like helped me with the genetics um, for my proposal because I was proposing something pretty crazy. Um, and so I, you know, I had many faculty friends um, read my both different parts of my application. I think I sent everybody my personal statement and my research proposal. And I think certain people just decided to focus on one or the other with whatever they felt their strengths were in helping me. Um, and so I, I probably sent it to maybe less than 10, but definitely like closer to maybe eight, like quite a few people read my um, statements. 
Um, I also use lots of formatting. Um, so lots of bolding, italicizing. I remember asking Dr. Dr. Mulligan, um, what, what, what is your personal preference? I know that you were a reviewer. Like, do you do you like the formatting? And he was like, No, I personally don't like it. It's very distracting. But in the end, I kept it because I really wanted the readers to remember certain parts of my application. So I bolded, italicized, underlined, kind of in themes of what I was pointing out. But I things I really wanted them to remember. And a lot of those things that I formatted um, were actually in the application. You you know write in other parts, publications you have awards you got, um, you know, other, other things that, you know, you, you kind of repeat things in multiple places. So I kind of definitely formatted those in my statements. Um, and then um, I saw Abby's question about like what to include broader impacts from undergrad or gap year. Uh, for me personally, I was trying to include whatever was relevant with the theme of broader impacts that I was trying to convey. So for me, um, I'm really, I'm really into like high school education and um, you know, inspiring these, you know, young kids before they go to college and make these decisions about what to major in and, you know, for career paths. Um, so in early college, I had, um, I was like a tutor for high school students and I had, you know, um, so I kind of kept with that theme to after graduating from undergrad, I was in a TA for one of the classes that I did, um, which was college, not high school, but it was still like a teaching theme. Um, and then now here at UCI, my first year, I got involved with um, Rota. We, reach out teach out which is like a high school program here and um, now I'm more involved with um, another high school program under the Cancer Research Institute um, which is like a youth science fellowship program and so in my broader impacts I kind of um, I, you, I went chronological order I definitely separated my intellectual merit and my broader impacts and I went in chronological order kind of ending with things I've started to get involved in here and here at UCI things I want to continue to do new things I want to do um, and so I talked about anything that was relevant. I didn't include every single broader impact thing I've done in my life. I really just tried to keep it to a theme. Um, and so I think that was, and so in thinking about that, um, I met with Dr. Mulligan actually my first year quite a few times, like, should I apply this year? Should I not, you know, I think I would be a competitive applicant as a first year student, but it was like the year I applied was the year the rules changed. So it was a decision, do I apply the first year and then, um, you know, one of the questions, I think it was also Erica's question is like, you know, do you write about the rotation project or not? My first year, I would have had to write about a rotation project in retrospect. I'm really happy I waited um, because I think the project I wrote about is like way cooler of an idea. And um, the letter of support I got was from my PI right now. You know, she, you know, was really um, firmly like, you know, believed in me and all that stuff. So I knew it would be like a really strong letter. Um, and so I think a lot, also what um, I was debating was what, what would I have the best broader impacts applying my first year or my second year? Um, I think I thought about it and I think, you know, I think I'll wait till the second year. And then I added more about what I did the first year at UCI. And then it kind of gave me this track record, if you will, of I've started to do these things. Now I'm going to continue to do them um, as a first year. <clears throat> maybe you haven't gotten involved in a lot of things yet. So you're more like, this is what I'm going to do going forward. So um, in the end, I'm really happy I applied my second year. Um, I think it allowed me to have a stronger proposal. Um, and I think that's all of the things I wrote down that I wanted to talk about. Um, yeah, I'm looking that's at great. the question. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. So um, we, uh, there's some time for Q&A if there's questions from the audience. The chat box has been really active and there's a number of people that have been responding about things so you, we may have already dealt but does anybody have a question they want to ask to the panel everybody shy um i have a question so if you apply to the nsf um your senior year of undergrad and you're applying again as uh, a graduate student, is it the same reviewers that look at your application or is it different reviewers? Very likely not. Um, I don't really have a good image for how many reviewers are in a panel. Um, but so I was in genomics and genetics and proteomics or something like that. And I'm guessing there was 50 faculty, you know, or something like that for that group. And then it's a national submission. 
And so, I mean, there's literally many hundreds of applicants in that, for that panel. So I think it would be extremely unlikely that you would wind up with the same reviewers uh, a second time. So I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't worry about that. I would take it as a new opportunity. Other questions? Um, I will ask. Um, so I have a lab that I think is the lab I most want to join and that's who I'm doing my second rotation with. And then my second ranking lab is who I'm doing my first rotation with. Um, and my first rotation is probably more aligned with my past experience and what I know. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out which one I should write the proposal for because I'll probably be more in touch with my first rotation professor, but yeah. I can comment on this a little bit actually. Um, so in my research proposal, um, I kind of wanted to highlight in terms of project or experiments that I was gonna propose, um, something that was like sophisticated, but something that I also knew I can do and I had research experience in. So I came from, um, at my old lab at UCLA, it was an epigenetics lab. And so I wanted to study kind of chromatin accessibility in different cell types in the gut um, using ATAC sequencing. And so I was able to really um, show through, you know, I think through my publications and my old, my old PI's letter that I was in an epigenetic lab. I know what I'm talking about. Um, and so I think that helped me in a way. So I had like two themes going. I talked a little bit about my teaching theme in the personal statement. And then my theme in the research proposal was epigenetics and it kind of, and then that was the only like link that I kind of combined the two. So I talked about epigenetics in my research statement. And then I, and then since, and I decided to just propose these experiments for my research proposal. I could have proposed other things, but I thought I want to choose maybe something that I have some experience in, um, you know, so. That worked out really well for Lindsay, and I think it actually makes good sense, uh, Kate. If you, you know, if you've got something that you know and you like and you have a history in, you have a familiarity with it, you know. So I think that makes good sense. Anybody else? Well. Thank you all. You know, I, the panels, panelists were terrific. Harinder does a great job. Um, yeah, I hope this was a useful experience for you. I'll try to set up some kind of a, a list where you can contact each other to get some support in writing. Um, don't forget, as some of the panelists mentioned, there's good resources over at Graduate Division. You can get a writing tutor to uh, read your materials there. Make sure you work with a faculty member and designing a project and that kind of stuff. If you're in a gateway program, you're probably first rotation or, you know, Kate, second rotation, whatever. Uh, but anyway, um, so thanks. Uh, I hope you found this useful. <laughs>